Today's reading is from Romans chapter 7. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man only as long as he lives? For example, by law a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive, but if her husband dies she is released from the law of marriage. So then, if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. So, my brothers, you also died to the law, through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him, who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. What shall we say, then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was, if the law had not said, Do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin sprang into my life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. And through the commandment put me to death. So then, the law is holy. And the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which was good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good that I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who does it, but it is sin living in me who does it. To understand this passage, we have to look back at the start of Romans chapter 7 to where Paul makes it clear that he's addressing at this point in his letter specifically those Christians in the Roman church who are substantially of a Jewish background. I am speaking, Paul says in verse 1, to those who know the law. These Christians must have found it very difficult to understand how the law that they were raised with in their devout Jewish homes applied, now that that same God had sent them something new in the person of Jesus, and now that they were part of something new, the Christian church, a community not tied together by circumcision or by the commandments, but by their shared redemption in Christ. Are these Jewish people betraying the faith of their ancestors by turning to the Christian church? Are they, as Paul speculates, leaving one husband for another? Paul responds to these worries by developing that metaphor of marriage to make sense of the transition these Jewish Christians have undergone as they have left, so to speak, the synagogue for the church. In a certain sense, these Jewish Christians are leaving their old covenant marriage and entering, entering into a new one, but not as an act of infidelity. Rather, these Jewish Christians are like the faithful widow who has loved and served one husband for many years, but who, after she has grieved his death, enters sincerely into a new one, a new thing, a new marriage not intended as a replacement for, or a divorce from, or an eradication of the old relationship, but as the beginning of something good, independent, and new, brought into being by the lawful freedom borne by the passing away of the old. The law has died, Paul says, in the sense that it has condemned us all to death. The law on its own could never fix the problem of sin, even though everything it stipulated was right and true. Because what was in need of fixing was the human heart itself, the heart that resists and rejects the law, 
that he's unwilling to be reformed by it. So Jewish Christians, as all Christians, die in Christ to the former law and are lawfully welcomed into something new. What is the value of the law, then? Paul wonders. If the law's only function was to condemn the world to sin, so that the world could turn from that point, was not the law itself then in some way sin or death? Just as pressingly, what is the value of knowing the law for these Jewish converts? If the Jewish converts are saved just as well by the same means as their Gentile brothers and sisters, what was the point of all that faithful study of the law through their Jewish upbringing? An upbringing that Paul himself shared. There is, in fact, tremendous value, Paul says, to the presence of these Jewish Christians in the Roman church, even if all are saved by the same means. For, as he says, they uniquely among Gentiles, knowing clear terms the life that God expects of saved Christians. They know it in an instinctual way the Gentiles never could. Paul notes the example of coveting. He, as a Jew, knew that coveting was wrong. He knew how it corrupted and polluted the human heart. He and his other Jews knew it from the ancient wisdom, the law of God that had been given to them. And they knew it in a way that Gentile Christians, coming out of a Roman world that was totally awash with coveting, in many ways praised it. They knew it in a way that those Christians simply could not. Consequently, we can only imagine that it would have been partly the duty of those Jewish Christians as they welcomed new Christian converts into the fold, to teach them, to teach them about the law of Christ as they were woven into their midst, shaped them and changed them by the gospel, not because those Jews were any less sinful themselves than their Gentile brethren, but because they alone, the pagan world, at least knew what sin was, even if they were equally capable of it. There is a parallel in this situation, I think, with our own day. As we increasingly habit the space of the first century church, a group of people offering a radically different way of living and serving God against the background of a broadly pagan culture, there will again be a special role for those in the church who, in our day, are, in a sense, the law-informed Christians, those raised in substantially Christian environments, saturated with ideas about what constitutes the godly man or woman from an early age, to communicate some of those instincts that our pagan world has overwhelmingly lost as new converts are woven into our midst. As the new Christian joins the church, a new Christian for whom it may not be instinctively obvious in the way that it is to many existing Christians that say lifelong marriage is the only right place for sexual intimacy, or that truth-telling and honest dealing are fundamentally important, in the same way that it would not have been obvious to many of those Gentile Christians whom Paul mentions that coveting was indeed a sin, it will be in part the responsibility of those in the remnant to reinstill some of those biblical instincts to new converts, not because they are any better at following them, not because they are any less sinful, but because they, like the overwhelmingly Jewish Christians upon whose teaching our church today owes much of its character, harbor a knowledge of right and wrong, of the law, of what sin is and of its dangers that our world has chosen to forget. Nevertheless, Paul concludes with something of a warning a clear statement that this knowledge of the law is only ever a partial thing, and that due to the sinfulness of the human heart, this knowledge on its own will never ensure salvation, even if it is of some benefit. For despite the fact that he, Paul, is as Jewish as he could possibly be in terms of his knowledge of the law, he sins all the time, because the problem is ultimately one of will, not of knowledge. No amount of learning could ever heal the human heart, because it is ultimately not for lack of knowledge that we reject God, but for lack of love. As Paul says, the good that I want to do, I do not do, but the evil that I do not want to do, this I do. As a former Pharisee, Paul could tell you better than anyone what was lawful and what was not. But that does not stop him, even him, from frequently breaking it, from frequently disobeying the law that he knows is right and pursuing things that he knows are not lawful or godly for the Christian man. Consequently, all of us, Jews and Gentiles alike, biblically literate and not biblically literate alike, must turn, to our, to, must turn to Christ alone for our hope of salvation. And this must be a reminder for the church in coming years. As the world does increasingly lose its knowledge of the Bible and of God's law, that despite the knowledge that the church continues to have of those things, 
This knowledge does not make the church any less a body of sinners than the world in which it is housed. As the church goes about its business of sharing with new converts a knowledge of God and his law and his nature, just as Jewish Christians must have done for the Gentiles all those years ago, the church in doing this is not saving the world. God saves the world, and the church is only ever the body of the saved. The church must preserve and hold dear to what it knows of the godly Christian life. But it must never, ever, as Paul warns, confuse this knowledge for thinking that it is any less sinful than the rest of the world, simply because it has this knowledge. Knowledge is good, but it is not action. And the heart that knows the law can sin just as readily as that which does not. All of us are ultimately one in Christ. There is no Jew nor Gentile, and none of us before the law is better than any other. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this um, amazing warning against against spiritual arrogance that we find in uh, in Romans chapter seven. Um, thank you for your law, thank you for the good thing that it is, and, and thank you, Lord, for the Jewish Christians in the early days of the church who must have communicated so much of the law to newfound Gentile converts. But Lord, for all of this. Help us to avoid spiritual arrogance in all of its forms, that regardless of our knowledge of your law, of the Bible, of whatever else, that regardless of those things, it is in Christ that we are saved, and that we must shed all of these things and turn to our Saviour and not rely on our own power. Because as Paul so powerfully says, knowledge of the law can never, ever save us. Lord, I pray that we be encouraged to shed all forms of spiritual arrogance as we as we reflect on this really powerful passage amen